Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Sci-Fi Ontario PHI Seminar Series Student Edition. I am Rachel MacArthur, the Professional Development Counselor with the Sci-Fi Ontario Branch Executive. There are a few announcements first. Sci-Fi Ontario would like to thank everyone for their support and feedback opposing the proposed changes to Regulation 566 and ensuring certified public health inspectors with the CPHIC designation continue to deliver vital services for boards of health in Ontario. We will be submitting our formal response to the ministry today and will be sharing with the membership via the listserv. If you aren't a Sci-Fi member, member, I urge you to reconsider and support your colleagues and the future of your profession. The second announcement is that Public Health Ontario has recently released two new checklists for infection prevention and control lapses in dental practice settings. One is the IPAC core elements in dental practice settings, and the other is in dental practice settings. These checklists are designed to support public health units and others while conducting inspections related to IPAC lab investigations. They are based on evidence-informed best practices from the Provincial Infectious Disease Advisory Committee's Infection Prevention and Control for Clinical Office Practice documents and legislative requirements for health and safety. These tools can also be used by institutions to conduct internal reviews of their own IPAC programs. These checklists were developed in collaboration with the Royal College of Dental Surgeons of Ontario, the College of Dental Hygienists of Ontario, and the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. These checklists can be located on the Public Health Ontario homepage. Lastly, there is no December session, but the PHI seminar series will resume on January 10th at noon. The title of the session is Navigating Uncharted Territory, the experience of public health inspectors and clinical IPAC audits within a public health unit. And it'll be presented by Jennifer Snow, Crystal Hendry, and Jan Lee, City of Hamilton Public Health Services. So now we're gonna move on to our webinar for today. Um, we, will we will remain in lecture mode for the duration of the session. If you have any questions, please send them through the chat pod located in the bottom right of the screen. We will answer all your questions at the end of the presentation. Also, if you can please indicate how many people are in the room with you in the chat pod, that would be great. Our first presentation is called Microbial Levels of Kibanea and is presented by Mahmoud Kanan. Mahmoud Kanan is a recent graduate from the Public Health and Safety Program at Ryerson University. He's always had a fascination with food and having the experience to carry out a study on this particular topic has been a remarkable experience. <clears throat> Hello everybody, my name is Mahmoud Kinan and today we are going to be talking about my research project regarding the microbial levels in Kibbeneyan. So before I carry on any further, I would just like to give a brief description of what exactly Kibbeneyan is for those who do not know. Kibbeneyan is a raw beef or lamb dish typically common in Middle Eastern countries such as Syria and Lebanon. It's not actually the only raw beef beef dish to exist for different regions around the world, such as Europe, uh, Vietnam, Korea, and Ethiopia actually have these dishes, and public health categorizes them all in the same category. Ingredients may vary when it comes to kibbeneya, but the basic uh, ingredients for it consist of raw beef or lamb, but it's, the cuts chosen usually have a low fat percentage, just because it wants to highlight the quality of the meat itself. And then you mix it with uh, bulgur or wheat staple, and then you add various spices and herbs to it. And then on the surface, once you mince all the ingredients together, you drizzle a little bit of olive oil, and then you may choose to put nuts and mint leaves. And then the dish itself is consumed with pita bread on the side. So I'd like to get into why exactly this dish is a public health concern. This dish is considered raw, ready to eat, just because there's no heat treatment prior to consumption in any way. So you just cut the, up the meat, mix it with the ingredients, and then consume it in that way. And the problem with that is the raw beef is associated with a lot of pathogens, such as E. coli, salmonella, listeriosis, staphylococcus, gastroenteritis, and campylobacter. So if the, any contamination occurs during the preparation of the dish, then it could result with infection of these illnesses. Another thing that's a concern is because this dish is consumed in a family setting, anyone that is of a vulnerable population, such as children, pregnant mothers, elderly, or any immunocompromised individual, if they were to consume this dish and it's contaminated, then they may experience a more severe outcome. 
Now, the purpose of this project is two things. This dish is actually banned in Ontario because it's seen as a hazard because it's not uh, cooked to 71 degrees Celsius. It's consumed raw, which is why it is banned. And that I, no research was actually done on it based on what I found. All I could find beforehand was two articles that took place in Lebanon 20 years ago. And the reason why an outbreak of listeria occurred was because raw pork was placed and mixed in with the dish. So what I wanted to do is start just a basic project to find and see if there is any concern that's actually associated with the dish. Not only that, but because I couldn't find anything on it, I would love for this project to actually aid anyone in the future if more research is to be conducted on this item. So what I did was I located the butcher shops, the Middle Eastern butcher shops in Toronto that actually sold the dish and what day of the week the meat would be the most fresh. That way I could go collect it. Once that was identified, I went and I walked in as a customer because the product is illegal. And a public health inspector came with me the first day of sampling to teach me how to collect the Cabernet samples. I had to purchase a sample between half a kilogram to a kilogram just so the butchers would actually sell, but I would only use 200 grams or place 200 grams inside a, a bag uh, in order to take it to the laboratory. I used the Public Health of Ontario uh, uh, sample collecting guide in order to help teach me on what exactly to do. And I collected a total of 30 samples across a month and a half period. So I'll go in every Wednesday and Thursday as a customer, grab the meat, take it outside the store, aseptically require, acquire using the aseptic bag technique, place it inside a refrigerated cooler, and then immediately take the sample to the University of Guelph Laboratory to conduct samples, or for them to conduct samples. The tools I used for this project were rather simple. I just had one ice pack, one pen, one permanent marker to label the bags, a small cooler to place the samples, a thermometer, and then 30 large size sample bags and 30 medium size sample bags. So the sampling took place between February 1st and March 16th. So if you look on top, you'll see that I labeled each location, location one, location two, location three, and then on the side of what exactly I was testing for. So for this uh, project, I was only focusing on total coliforms and E. coli. Now automatically, you might notice that there may be some empty spaces. That's because certain days, either I physically was unable to go collect the samples, but the majority of it was because the butchers refused to actually give the samples throughout the process. So if you look at that, yeah, until March 15th. So in order for me to identify whether there is a concern, I used the 2010 Ready-to-E guidelines. And what that told me was satisfactory levels are 10 to the 2 or lower for ready-to-eat foods. Marginal levels are 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3, and then unsatisfactory levels are 10 to the 3 or above. So for E. coli, uh, satisfactory levels are 10 or less CFU per gram. Marginal is between 10 to 100, and then unsatisfactory is uh, above 100. Now, if you're looking at the top left pie chart, you'll see that 70% of the samples came back unsatisfactory, while 27% came back marginal, and 3% came back satisfactory. But for E. coli, 83% came back satisfactory, 10% came back unsatisfactory, and then 7% came back marginal. The limitation I had for this study was that when looking at this document, this is the most up-to-date document I could find regarding ready-to-eat foods. And the problem is all ready-to-eat foods are classified in one category. So whether it be raw beef or raw fish or salad with hard-boiled egg on top, all of it had to fall under the satisfactory level of 10 to the 2, which is why I wanted to look at different documents from around the world in order to see if their documents are different, how they would uh, classify the information, how they would see if the dish was safe or not. And I looked at the 2014 Hong Kong standards and the 2016 Ireland ready to eat uh, standards, and their results were very different. So the difference between the Ontario and the Ireland and Hong Kong standards is the Ireland and Hong Kong standards classified each ready to eat food item in separate categories. So you'll have a section for ready to eat meat, ready to eat fish, and they would have their own acceptable limits. So rather than the acceptable total coliform limit being 10 to the 2 or lower, for raw, ready-to-eat meat and fish, acceptable limits in Hong Kong and Ireland are 10 to the 6 or lower. So if we're following those standards, 97% came back satisfactory for total coliforms, and 3% came back marginal. So 0% came back unsatisfactory. But for Ireland and Hong Kong, when it came to the E. coli counts, it's quite similar to Ontario. So rather than it being 83%, that's satisfactory, 
dissatisfactory. And then 10% is unsatisfactory and 3% is marginal. So to conclude this presentation, what I found was if we're following the Ontario standards, then there is a concern when it comes to handling practices. But when it comes to E. coli, 10% isn't too big of a concern, but it's still present and there is a certain degree of uh, concern to some level. Also, <clears throat> due to the unavailability, uh, unavailability of new guidelines, uh, based on my research, I found that after 2013, people didn't look at total coliforms. They looked at enterobacteria because it's seen as more environmentally hardy. So my recommendation is if we were to update the guidelines for total coliforms or just the document itself, then the do uh, maybe the results may be different next time. And I personally believe further research should be conducted on this product for further knowledge because this was just the fourth year the student project. So if anyone wanted to do anything further with it in the future, then that would be great. And it would help have an, a concrete understanding of what the true concern is. And maybe if in the future it is seen as not of a concern, uh, maybe it could be legalized under certain conditions. So what I tried to do during my uh, sampling is I did a visual inspection to see what exactly was going on, and I noticed a few things. For example, only certain employees were allowed to prepare the dish. It could only be prepared when the meat was fresh. It was made per order, certain things like that. So it opens up a whole new realm of different ways to look at it and do research on these raw ready-to-eat meat items. So acknowledgments I'd like to mention, my professors from Ryerson University, Dr. Ian Young, Dr. Joan Tustin, Dr. Richard Meldrum, thank you very much. Toronto Public Health, thank you very much for providing my supplies and workers from Toronto Public Health, Chris McDonald and Joseph Xavier. And I'd also like to thank Ryerson University for funding this project and the University of Guelph Laboratory for testing my samples. Thank you very much. These are my references. Okay, thank you, Mahmoud. Our second presentation is the relationship between construction and West Nile virus transmission. It will be presented by Adam King. Adam King is a recent graduate of Ryerson University's public health program. As a student, he spent his summers as a vector-borne disease student working with Peel Public Health. Since completing his practicum at the North Bay Perry Sound District Health Unit, Adam has been working on contract with North Bay as an uncertified public health inspector where he sat his BOC exam in October. My project specifically looks at um, subdivision construction, just to kind of differentiate between the uh, to, between the generality of the word construction here. Um, and, and some of the background on it kind of really stretches my days as a West Nile student with uh, the region of Peel. And a lot of what I noticed was that um, in developing areas where you had subdivisions under construction, there were plenty of pools of standing water um, you know, from various sources none of which that we could do anything about because construction sites were prote are protected under the Trespass to Property Act. And as such, we need express permission. We would have needed express permission from the construction company or the owner of the property to do anything about it. And, and with the liability of having students running around on a construction site checking out pools of standing water is just too, was deemed to be just too great. So we stayed away from them to begin with. But that really planted the seed of, you know, do these pools present any sort of uh, increase in the health hazard of the transmission of West Nile virus? So it goes without saying that these, these small pools are what the, the mosquitoes use to breed and lay their eggs and, and for the larvae to hatch. Um, now, whether these pools are genuinely um, suitable is a totally different different issue and not something that I looked at in this study. So I just assumed uh, with this that if, if it was true, then the, these pools do provide a, uh, a breeding ground for, for mosquitoes. And, and these stagnant pools are very typical features of construction sites. And while 
many health units, specifically in southern Ontario, employ larviciding tactics. Another thing that really kind of pushed, pushed me into this research was looking into what happens with newly developed areas, and that the, the larviciding program is not legally obligated to be conducted on subdivisions that haven't yet been assumed by a, mis, a, a municipality. So in the research, this is, this is a period of anywhere between three to six years from the date of shovels in the ground to assumption of the property where there are catch basins, tire ruts, um, general landscaping features that can provide a breeding source or a breeding ground source for mosquitoes and they go unchecked. So this, like I said, catch basins and, and, and really sort of uh, divots on the land. So th this is a little bit more of a, a comical representation of it, but it really accurately illustrates what happened. When you're dealing with fresh ground, you have to landscape it. And in doing so, you're driving heavy equipment, you're altering it, you're leaving divots and tire ruts and marks and generally just holes in the ground that are probably going to be filled eventually, but in the meantime can carry and, and uh, collect water. The real uh, sort of main concern to me evolved from seeing these pools on the ground as a student to when doing the research, now I'm most concerned with the catch basins because these are in the ground for much longer than any scars on the earth on the property. And typically, they provide the ideal breeding, breeding points for the Culex mosquito, which is the primary vector of concern for West Nile virus. Um, and, and with catch basins going untreated with larvicide, the, my thought was that this could potentially uh, create a greatly increased risk of West Nile transmission for, for, air, for the areas surrounding the construction site. So the existing research, um, there, there's a few studies that have looked at construction and proximity on their own. Uh, one study that, that really kind of was conducted in Ghana it illustrated that construction has the ability to increase the number of breeding points that, uh, that a mosquito can use. And another study out of Africa, this one was of malaria, indicated that the closer someone lived to a swamp or a, a breeding site or a number of breeding sites, uh, the greater likelihood that the population had of getting malaria, of being infected with it. None of those two variables have been studied together, though, and neither of them have been studied in Canada. So this is what really kind of made me go, there's a, there's a real knowledge gap here and want to explore this further. For, the, for my study, I looked at uh, the mean flight distance to kind of set off, the set, set up a cutoff distance for, for what I would consider under the influence of construction and not under the influence of construction. And the research pointed to 1.3 kilometers. And so to be conservative, I went with one and a half as the cutoff distance. So, Big thanks to Peel Public Health here who granted me access to their CDC adult trap data with a time period of 2005 to 2006. This is over 3,000 individual pieces of data. Um, and, and what I did with that was I took the spreadsheets, calculated what the mean number of mosquitoes caught per batch was for each trap for each of those um, 12 years. So I used the trap mean as a proxy for risk instead of looking at, say, the number of times it went, uh, a batch went positive for West Nile at it, because I figured the larger the number, the more likely you are to get bit by a mosquito. And when we're really, with, with all the research recently looking at um, West Nile virus and, and the data collected by PHO, it seems that years that produce greater numbers of mosquitoes tend to produce uh, a higher number of human infections as well. 
Um, so on, to on top of the mean, I also calculated the standard deviation for that, which was used to plug into uh, a um, statistical analysis. Um, so when I designated or assigned the, the value of construction or no construction to a trap for a particular year, I used two sources. I was very fortunate uh, with the timing of my study that Google and Time magazine came out with an online tool that provided a global time lapse and animated it for the Earth from, any, from, some, year, from some time in the 1980s to the present day. And in terms of assessing when a subdivision was assumed and when now a health unit was legally obligated to provide the larva siding service, I used building department records of, of each of the municipalities within uh, the region of Peel. So Caledon, Brampton, and Mississauga. So this is just a kind of a screen grab of, um, of the time lapse I'm speaking about. And you can see how much um, development there is within specifically Brampton, but Mississauga had quite a bit as well. And Caledon, which is historically rural, tended to remain that way. There were maybe one or two developments, and none of them really fell within a range that, within the range that qualified them as uh, influencing a trap. So with, with traps that fell within one and a half kilometers of subdivision construction site, they were eligible for the construction designation. And to calculate the distance from trap, I used Google Earth's GIS function uh, to, to plot and as the crow flies distance between the, um, the geographic coordinates of the trap and the outer edge of the construction site. The date of subdivision assumption was used as a qualifier for ending the construction designation. And the data set uh, was graphed and then analyzed visually and was also analyzed using a, a non-parametric Mann-Whitney test. And this was because the data was very, very abnormally, it was not normally distributed at all and, and couldn't be interpreted with, with another statistical test based on the way I uh, decided to analyze the data. So some of the results when you're looking at here, the, the biggest thing to note was that, oh, it seems like there's some cutoff there. Um, the biggest thing to note was that there were quite a few outliers. Uh, one particular trap within the region, which had the, the name uh, B2, um, it, it tended to produce the greatest number of outliers. And it's responsible for three out of the main grouping of outliers on the first graph on the left. Um, when looking at the graph on the left, too, you do notice that there is a slight, in the main grouping, in the thick blue bar, there's a slightly higher uh, mean. Now, when it was, when it was analyzed later, it, it, we came to a, a different conclusion with that, but we'll get to that in a bit. The graph on the right is really what's important for this analysis. And when you're looking at that, when you exclude the outliers, you notice that there's a general sort of wave pattern in the way that the, uh, the graph, uh, in, in the way that the data presents on the graph. And, and this is indicative of whether having the greatest influence on a traps, uh, on the mean number of mosquitoes produced. And so now we're getting to the, um, to the statistical analysis. And, and while I mentioned earlier, or on the last slide with the uh, thick blue bar being marginally higher, when we looked at that with, the, with a statistical analysis, uh, with the Mann-Whitney test, it, it it came out that it, it was not statistically significant. And so because of that, it's, it's, it's difficult to really claim that this is, um, and definitively that this influences uh, the risk of West Nile virus transmission to the immediate population. Um, 
However, it, I, I do think it is something that should be explored further, maybe with a larger data set and uh, probably and definitely with some controls to be put in place on um, on uh, factors like weather and geography. So the end result of this really is that there was no statistically significant relationship to be seen. However, it is important to keep in mind with this study that it is a fourth-year undergraduate study uh, with, with a very limited scope and that this is a topic that should be explored further. And I think the, while, while the data illustrated that it wasn't statistically significant, I think that there may be a different or, or a more interesting result if, we, if, if this is explored further with some more controls put into place. Um, and lastly, it's, it's, this study indicates that in all likelihood it is likely weather that is the greatest effect on West Nile transmission risk, which I think is really no surprise to most people. references, and I'd also like to thank um, the Region of Peel, Dr. Wendy Pons and Dr. Ian Young for being involved and being co-authors on this study. Okay, thank you, Adam. Our last presentation is called Bug Out, Antimassage Safety Risk in Legislative Review. It's presented by Nicole Jichnowit. Nicole has a Bachelor of Applied Science from Ryerson University with a spe specialization in public health. She completed her practicum at Niagara Region Health Unit and recently partook in the BOC Oral Board on October 25th. Nicole completed her research on entomophagy during her undergrad at Ryerson University. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nicole Yushnevich. I just wanted to start off with how my research journey began. While completing my undergrad at Ryerson, I chose to participate in a course called ENH 866 Research Project 2, an optional course that leads to completing research that, amazingly, not all students choose to accomplish. Thus began my research, bugged out, entomophagy safety risks and legislative review. I also just wanted to make sure that this research is still a work in progress and that the information presented to you all today is preliminary information on the up and coming topic of intimacy. Henceforth, my research question was, what does, current what does current literature say about the major health risks of eating insects and what legislation is currently in place in developed countries to regulate edible insects? The methodology used was reviewing current literature on potential health hazards surrounding entomophagy and current policies and regulations in place in Canada, the US, the European Union, Australia, and New Zealand. The literature was systematically searched by key terms to identify a specific entomophagy subject matter. The literature was organized by key terms used, ways in which they were found, and the key information drawn from the literature. Gaps in literature were also recorded. So what is entomophagy? Entomophagy is the act of eating insects. Once considered taboo in Western culture, it is now becoming more common due to travel, trade, and immigration. Globally, approximately 2 billion people eat insects regularly. The most common eaten insects include the house cricket and mealworm. With an increase in entomophagy, there is a need to research potential health hazards associated with the consumption of insects because policies and procedures may need to be created or updated in Ontario and or Canada. This review of policy was done to create a baseline knowledge of what other countries have done to regulate insects intended for human consumption. So, what are some potential health hazards associated with entomophagy? There are microbial risks, environmental pathogens such as Listeria, Bacillus cereus, Campylobacter and E. coli can all find their way onto edible insects, especially if insects are eaten raw or harvested from the wild and not from a controlled farming facility. These risks are similar to eating traditional meats when there is no control or processing step. There are physical hazards. These include non-digestible parts of an insect, such as jaws, legs, spines, and wings. These can vary by species. There are chemical hazards. 
hazards, which can be categorized into two subgroups. One, the insect itself may carry a toxin, such as scorpions, and two, toxic substances may find their way onto insects, such as pesticides, especially if insects are harvested from the wild. There are risks of allergens. Individuals with existing allergies to house death mice or shellfish may be affected since they are taxonomically similar. There is also a risk of developing sensitivities after repeat exposure. Where there is a gap in research is in allergy testing for edible insects. The gold standard for allergy testing is having a double-blinded, placebo-controlled oral food challenge, which hasn't been completed as of yet for edible insects. Therefore, what can be done to mitigate these potential hazards? Building a hazard analysis flowchart is one way to approach these hazards for each individual insect that may be eaten. A long and tedious task, but one that may be necessary since there is such a vast variability of in insects. Presented is an example of a flowchart created by myself using information collected from literature about the house cricket. This leads us to what current government policies are out there concerning edible insects. In Canada, the CFIA, Canadian Food Inspection Agency, categorizes edible insects into two groups, either as novel foods or as non-federally non regulated commodities. Insects deemed not to have a history of safe use are classified as novel foods under the Food and Drug Regulations. Producers of novel foods submit their information to Health Canada for further determination. Insects with a long history of safe use, such as the house cricket and mealworm, are classified as non-federally regulated commodities, which are covered under the Imported and Manufactured Food Program under CFIA. All foods intended for, intended for human consumption may comply, must comply with the Food and Drug Act, and the CFIA inspects premises producing non-federally re regulated commodities to the general principles of food hygiene, composition, and labeling guidance documents. In the U.S., two bodies oversee federal food commodities. The USDA regulates meat, poultry, and eggs, and the FDA regulates food, drugs, and cosmetics outside the USDA scope. Currently, edible insects can be classified as food under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Insects raised for human consumption should follow current goods good manufacturing practices. There is a significantly large gap in literature pertaining to U.S. regulations surrounding edible insects. In Australia and New Zealand, the regulatory body is FSAN, the Food Standards of Australia and New Zealand. Under FSAN, a food that does not have a history of, of human consumption requires a risk assessment to be completed by the federal authority. According, according to FSAN, edible insects are considered new, non-traditional foods and have been identified as a majority having no, con uh, no safety concerns. Literature surrounding what Australia and New Zealand does is also minimal. There appears to be a gap in literature surrounding what occurs when safety risk is present in edible insects. In the European Union, all new foods with potential health risks must complete a pre-market risk assessment. Since 2015, the EU had declared edible insects a novel food under a new regulation. Under a new regulation, under the new novel food regulation, insects with historically safe use, which the EU specifically points to having 25 plus years of use after review, is allowed for distribution. This new regulation is not enforceable until 2018. Therefore, if currently if producers of edible insects cannot wait until 2018, they may follow the steps under the old, less permissive regulation. Under the EU's new novel food regulation, edible insects are declared as novel foods and must complete a notification process under Article 15 outlined by this timeline. The applicant submits the notification to the EU Commission, which then has one month to notify verification, which then delegates the EFSA European Food Safety Standards and its member states to a four-month safety assessment of the notification. They can rule that there is no safety object, that there are safety object, objections or not. If there are safety objections, the applicant can further apply for authorization under Article 16. The applicant then sends information regarding the duly noted safety objections. The Commission then forwards the information back to EFSA and its member states 
states, which then have six months to make a determination. Extensions are possible if additional information is required from the applicant. If granted, the Commission can then draft an Implementing Act authorizing the traditional food and submit it to, our, to the Article 30 Standing Committee to be adopted. Or alternatively, the Commission may terminate the pro procedure. In conclusion, there is a need to regulate edible insects intended for human consumption because of, because of the aforementioned potential health hazards. With, with further immigration, trade, and travel, growth in this market is increasing. As the public grows more aware of an environmental concerns, edible insects are on the leading edge of, of a search for a secondary source of protein. A recent article in the Toronto Star published on November 3rd outlines how edible insects are an eco-friendly food source, utilizing less water and resources compared to other traditional sources of animal protein, such as cattle. As well as added dietary benefits claim, and perhaps an option for vegetarians based on their personal preferences, there certainly is a potential for growth in this market. Canada is not on the forefront of regulating edible insects, but does have suitable regulations in place for current demand. But with a growing market, there may need to be a change. New regulations specifically outlining edible insects have not been passed in Canada, as has been in the EU. There are also still many gaps in literature to be filled, such as having a common consensus as to what temperature and processes are suitable for the regulation of insects, given their variability. Gaps also appear in what foodborne illnesses have been previously linked to edible insects, given underreporting in countries where insects are regularly eaten. Therefore, the public health risk is having new, new insect foods be introduced that do not have a large health history and have not been assessed for risk. Thank you for listening to my presentation, and a large thank you to my co-authors, Dr. Ron Kushak and Dr. Melissa Mose. And if you have any further questions that haven't been answered here, please feel free to contact me at njuchnie at ryerson.ca. Okay, thank you, Nicole. So we're going to open up the floor to questions. Um, so if you have any questions, please continue to put them in the chat pod. Um, there's a few on here. So for Mamu, we have a question here from Lampton Public Health asking, um, in your research, have you looked into if tatar, uh, beef tatar is banned anywhere in Ontario or kind of um, any information on that? I, have, I communicated a lot with Toronto Public Health, and while at different events such as sci-fi, I talked to inspectors from there. So right now, steak tartar or beef tartar is heavily debated. What makes it so much different from Kipanea, even though they're in the same category, is when it comes to the preparation of the dish, it's minced by hand. So the biggest problem with Kipanea is it could be minced by hand or by machine. If you're mincing it by machine, essentially if there's any contamination, you're grinding it and flipping it all inside out with each other. Beef tartar, they're still looking at it right now based on my knowledge, but whenever they do go to uh, places that sell it, I know that it has to be made per order, it has to be refrigerated properly, uh, has to be minced by hand only, and different things like that. I know it's still an ongoing discussion when it comes to that. I hope I answered your question. And there's a follow-up question as well. Um, at the locations where you were able to purchase the illegal food product, mm -hmm. was there any follow-up? Any follow-up? Follow -up. Uh, you might have... Uh, oh, sorry, I guess maybe um, any follow-up with the people who sold it to you, I'm assuming is what they mean? No. I, Landon, if you could clarify that, that would be great. Yeah, I, was like, I walked in as a customer to purchase uh, a sample. Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't, like the public health inspector came with me the first day just to teach me how to sample it. So I'd walk in, I'd purchase the sample, take it outside, and then I would use the inverted bag to, to actually take the sample. But no follow-up from the operators. So when you said, sorry, I just want to expand maybe on this. You said they refused to give you the sample. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know they sold it? And there's just a person working that day that says you don't sell this. Or like, how, how did that, what, how, what happened when you asked uh, for it? Uh, I explained earlier how only specific employees are actually allowed to make the dish itself. So usually when I was talking to the person that would, uh, who was working, it was usually the manager. Like, like it was the okay. manager that was, talking to me on the phone, so they'd answer the phone and they'd uh, tell me, okay, the meat is not fresh today, 
I cannot give you the dish today. So if you could come back the next day. Then okay, so it's normally like it wasn't fresh that day, so they could sold it, sell it to you. That's why they would sell it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so um, for you, Adam, I guess there's a couple comments here from Curtis. Sure. Um, he says it would be interesting to look at numbers of Hewlett Tipians in uh, restaurants as you may get different results. I don't know if you have any comment on that. So for, for what I was able to look at, I wasn't really able to go at it with a very detailed scope. My initial thought would be to isolate the number of QX uh, and uh, restaurants. But I just took a general mean production average across the entire species, the, the entire grouping of it, and looked at what the average number of mosquitoes caught by each trap was, and, and kind of used that as a proxy. So I agree. I think it would be better to look into it in more detail. It's just unfortunate that I wasn't able to go through that with the scope of my study being, as, or really the detail of it being as basic as it was. And then he further just says that um, positive mosquito pools may give an indication of risk at those who are the ones carrying the virus. Just and, and that's something that I considered as part of the, design, uh, the, the study design. But when I really thought about it, it, all it takes is for one positive mosquito in a batch of 10,000 to make a batch positive. So it, it makes it difficult to really identify what the individual risk per bite is. And if, that, and if that's something that we can determine, then I totally agree. I think that's a much better uh, way of going about and analyzing the research, or analyzing the data, sorry. Okay, and then Mark Nelder said it might be interesting to study mosquito species community between construction and non-construction sites. Curious, curious which one would be more diverse. That's a very good point, yeah. Um, and then for Unicol, there is, uh, from Lampton again, are there any regulations that you came across in your studies um, from Asia? Unfortunately, I think we can all say that time was of the essence with these research projects. Um, so me and my co-authors, we chose countries that have similar regulations or regulations that were at the forefront or comparable to what we have currently in Canada, and what can we do to improve our own policies and procedures? Um, I guess I have a question for you, Nicole. So during your studies, I know um, you probably didn't look much into this, but we kind of spoke beforehand. Um, are there any dishes or food products that you've come across um, that are big sellers here in Ontario or that um, might be bugs in certain things that we uh, wouldn't necessarily expect there to be bugs in? <laughs> So I specifically actually for myself and for going around presenting this research at the symposium at Ryerson, I've purchased edible insects. Specifically, I purchased them from Loblaws down here in Toronto. So they are available and also sometimes in dishes, they may also be gone, uh, they might go by scientific name. So for the house cricket, its scientific name is Achta domesticus. So there may be some confusion, and if, especially if the scientific name is not known. Um, also, do you, do you know if anywhere in Ontario we're producing these foods? Like you talk about these um, foods coming in, like dry crickets, or yes. steamed crickets, and stuff. Um, do we produce them here, so your knowledge, or is it all important? We do. So there is um, where I bought mine from is from Loblaws, but they uh, they buy roasted crickets from a producer called Entomo Farms, which is uh, a producer in Peterborough. So not going into all of, uh, I did speak with somebody at Peterborough Health Unit, but um, they did not want to be mentioned. And I think uh, uh, the, the aspect over there is uh, very confidential because it is also Entomo Farms' private um, way about going with such uh, I guess, uh, producing secrets. <laughs> and are these big sellers? <laughs> uh, I bought them personally, so I think they're, they're, they're up and coming for sure, especially in novel foods if somebody wants to try something. They also come in um, ground formula, so you can buy them as a protein powder. 
as a replacement, I guess, to whey or vegan protein. Are there any more questions online? We have a question here in the room. Is there a link with the type of meat and level of bacteria? I'm assuming this is for Mahmood. I'm sorry, can I read? Is there a link with the type of meat and level of bacteria? Uh, yeah. Oh, and I believe, uh, I didn't really look at the difference. It was just the difference focusing mainly on. Sometimes for today, people have in the past, like I've heard people using goat. So I wouldn't know uh, the difference just because I focused on raw beef. I found it very interesting when you were comparing the um, total coliform to the E. coli level um, and the significance with that and how different that was from one to the other, um, and also versus Ireland and I think you said Hong Kong. Now, I actually have a question for that. Did uh, in your studies, Ireland and Hong Kong, are they allowed to serve this dish? Have you did you research anything on that? I, to be honest, like I searched numerous websites and like just anything I could find, I couldn't find anything on the dish. Versus like there were the three articles that I found. Two of them I said earlier was regarding the same event on the outbreak that happened. And the third one was just a hypothesis, because we'll talk about trichinella levels in pregnant women in African countries and uh, Middle Eastern countries. And they just said it may, like, one of the reasons why this could be is because of this. I couldn't find anything else. That's why uh, the objective for the study was to aid anyone in the future if they wanted to, because I personally couldn't find anything. If you guys, anyone out there, if you, could, if you have any, like, knowledge, then please email me. It, it could help with my research or just anything that will progress. Because Dave Tartar, there's a lot of information on, uh, especially now, beef Tartar Steak Tartar, the biggest raw ready beef item here. And then there's the Ethiopian dish uh, Kifo, which there's a lot of information on that. There's the Korean dish Yuko. And then there's the Vietnamese one, which I might, forgive me if I'm butchering the, if I'm butchering the pronunciation, but I think it's Ba Tai Chen. So you can find information on those products, but Kibbeni is more new. Okay. Any other questions online? Okay, uh, I would like to thank everyone on the webinar who joined us today for the SciFi Ontario seminar series. It is great to have such participation online. I'd also like to thank our presenters, Mamu Kanan, Adam King, and Nicole Jishnowitz. I ask you to reflect on how the information provided in this session can be used in your current work setting. Also, please ensure to complete the evaluation form for the session, and I hope you tune in on January 10th for our next session. Thank you, everyone.